everybody, we're the Brokes, and uh, we've got a very special guest with us today. Uh, the one and only legendary Gordon Raphael is in the room. So uh, everybody say hi. Hey, hi. Man. Thanks for doing this with us today, man. We really appreciate it. My uh, pleasure. Good to be here. Yeah. Um, so just before we get into the nitty gritty of it, just like a off the top of our head question, like, if you were going to a desert island, top five favorite albums, or if you're stranded uh, on a runway in Toronto over Christmas, what five uh, five albums um, would you take with you? Okay, let's see. You're gonna you probably want to cancel the rest of the, the talk after this, but <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna tell you what I've been listening to lately. Okay, uh, "Stand Up" by Jethro Tull, number one. Number two. Extrapolation by John McLaughlin. Just can't get enough of that album right now. It's just like guitar heaven. Such a great record. Let's see. Um, let's see. Velvet Underground with Nico with the banana on the cover. For sure. Loving that one. Now I got two more. Um, oh, yeah. Uh, a posthumous Jimi Hendrix album called Cry of Love. Like that album, I just really dig it. And... I, I couldn't live without Electric Ladyland by Hendrix as well. So two Hendrix albums are going with me, and I'll be okay on that desert island. That's so awesome. That's great list. Yeah. Yeah. I've got some homework to do. I definitely okay. Uh, definitely grew up with Jethro Tull's Thick as a Brick in the basement. Wow, yeah, yeah. The, the earlier stuff was more like freaky and dark and rocking with some of the greatest bass playing. It's just like this fluid bass player guy who's out of this world. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, I remember. Have you ever seen the Rock and Roll Circus? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, that's yeah. a good example. Yeah, except for was that, was that the bass player at that time? I, I think it's, that? that's the bass player. They they were the only band that lip synced in the whole Rock and Roll Circus. Know. Really? Their guitar their guitar player couldn't make it, and so Tom Tommy Iommi from uh, Black Sabbath stood in for that performance, but it's the only one that was lip synced. Unfortunately, when that record, when that movie finally came out, I was so excited, like, yeah. yeah. And then, oh man, a lip oh, no. disappointment, but yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. Cause I was struck by that bass player in that performance. So you, you yeah. just like the way he, he moved and attacked the instrument. So yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Interesting. So on, I, I guess a good, jumping off point for us right now would be um well first of all the book was fantastic really thank you so much man it's yeah. so cool that someone read my book wow oh my god oh, yeah. yeah it's uh it was so rich with not only musical and cultural history but i loved how much you put yourself into it and just how raw you were and thanks you know i had, very, I had sort of laid it all out i had some publishing offers where they said hey you know if you could take out everything that wasn't related to the strokes, like we'd really love this book. And I was like, no, it's not. I mean, that's the center of my story here, but it's about, you know, how I got there and like my ideas and stuff. <laughs> I think, I think it's very relatable for a lot of people, but especially as being musicians and just hearing how certain things came to be. And a lot of that comes from personal experience, right? So it's very right. integral that you, we understood who who Gordon was through the book, you know, and, and what led you yeah. to certain experiences. And I guess on that, I wanted to start off by asking you a little bit about um, working with Scott Clark. And wow, okay. that's so Lazo. cool! So yeah. cool. You asked that. Here's why. Yeah. I just got I just got back from a month in New York City, all of October, right. and I was using, I was using Scott Clark's studio, a new one that he has. No way. Almost every I recorded, I, I recorded uh, sixteen bands while I was there in October, oh, and and probably fourteen of them were done at Scott's studio. So I've actually reconnected with my very first studio partner. He was overjoyed that I brought so much business in October, and uh, he's a genius. Right. Um, he was a bait rock and roll bass player who decided he wanted to get into recording. And he's kind of a just a, ge a real genius guy. He was graduated from college really early, and he was instructing digital art in the like in late '90s. He was teaching at one of the best colleges in New York, and he said, "Hmm, the best way I could make a studio is by reading interviews with all my favorite." This is before the internet was really where you could read on the internet. He looked up magazines and newspapers of 
all his favorite engineers, like Neil Young's engineer, uh, Pink Floyd, Rolling Stones, all this stuff. And then he put together whatever they said their favorite mic was, their favorite preamp. He got a little bit of everything that was said to be the favorite. And he made the studio with a little bit of the best gear in the world. Mm -hmm. And so when I landed at his studio in New York, I'd spent all my life recording just in my basement with like a 57 and an A track. And, you know, very, I didn't know what a good preamp was or a good microphone was. So landing at his studio in 1998, I got my first chance to really see what these German microphones and these British preamps and compressors were doing. And it upped my recording game immensely. Right. Well, I mean, that really answers my question. I was going to ask you what it was like for you personally as an engineer at that time and culturally, because there was so much, and you outlined this in the book, there was so much new technology coming in and just changing the landscape. Yeah. Chateau Relaxo and, and you, your work there was such an integral time in history for i would say that scott's idea for chateau relaxo which was like classic analog circuits going into a computer and computers were new for music they were just now at that point able to handle like 16 tracks of input and stay awake you know 24 hours a day and not fall down and require maintenance all the time so it was a new kind of technique yeah. and one of the funny stories which you might remember from the book is that for the first couple months i basically had to call him at his day job every few days like scott i accidentally erased somebody's tambourine solo how do i find it apple z okay thank you so he was saving my life on a daily basis it was really funny it's so key to have people like that around absolutely great well uh uh, carrying on, just uh, I'm gonna throw a question out to you, just um, a real easy one. But uh, I'm one of the guitar players in this band, and uh, something I've always heard rumor about over the years in Room on Fire is that uh, Nick Valencia was just like rifling through uh, uh, Deville's Hot Rod Deville's, like he blew up a bunch making 1251. How many amps yeah. did you guys go through on that song? I don't really remember that as a feature. Um, I remember it was a hot summer and we were having a couple over, like it was kind of hot in the studio. Um, he might have blown a bunch of tubes or something and needed replacing here and there. But it wasn't like a weird, I don't remember a weird psychic storm where amps were being brought in. <laughs> left, right? I don't think we even had access to lots of amps or replacement amps. It wasn't like Fender was coming by the studio with a truck. I don't believe that's true. Okay. It, for, for my memory, and I write it in my book, we had that one piece of equipment, the Millennia Tube preamp. And it was because we were using this giant SSL console. And at a certain point, Julian said, I hate the way the SSL has recorded our guitars. What can we do about that? And so we tried every piece of equipment in the studio and every plug-in. And it turned out if we exported the guitars every time we played them through this Millennia Tube preamp, that it, it made Julian smile. He said, okay, yeah, that's a better sound. But that thing was overheating and blowing up and falling down all the time until the guru, J.P. Bowersock, came up with the idea to unscrew the lid, get a big wow. fan, like the can you cool yourself down and aim it at that piece of equipment all day long while we were using it. That's the one piece of equipment I remember blowing up, but I don't remember amp destruction being a feature of that song. Oh, that's awesome to hear. I got to say thanks for clarifying that. I can let go easier on my uh, my Hot Rod Deluxes now and, and not think I need to blow them up every time I'm trying to do that part. Yeah, yeah. Um, I remember it wasn't that difficult to record that song because I remember... The big feature of that song was that when I heard him do that melody, which I thought was just sensational, like, wow, that is a killer tone and a killer melody. I said, I've got one idea. And it was the first time and only time on any of the Strokes records where I suggested an overdub, like a double. OK. And I said, if I was playing this on my synthesizer, my ARP Odyssey, I would slightly detune the oscillators to give it an even fatter sound. So I told him to tune his tuning pegs down just a touch, like not even a turn, just like a touch. 
on every string, just detune it a touch and play the same riff again. And I put that second out of tune thing slightly under the main one, and it makes it even fatter and more like a synthesizer. Oh, wow. wow. Okay. Like, yeah, I remember reading about that part in the book about the uh, uh, detuned um, chorus, but I didn't realize yeah, yeah. like it was actually him double tracking himself slightly out of tune. Yeah, That's because... Crazy. Because my favorite synth has two oscillators, and if you put them exactly the same pitch, it's kind of thin, and it's kind of like, eh, whatever. But if you put it slightly out of pitch, it just makes it sound like it's really fat. And I tried to just think, could that work with guitar? And that's what we did there. And it worked. That's like a classic tone for the 21st century. I agree. And I was everybody's really happy with that idea, even though it kind of went against our no no doubles code it, it that was a, a special exception right beautiful that's what i love about recording is when you, you know you're not using all the bells and whistles necessarily but you're you're coming at it from a minimal approach with maximal experimentation i think a lot of yeah what I, what I like about recording is you never know what you're gonna if you knew what you're getting every time it was just totally about knowledge and control it would be so boring it would just be like a, a job a repetitive job but it, no matter who comes in the studio with a guitar and an amp, it just sounds different. It just sounds different, and it makes a different blend with whoever's standing next to them. So I really like the you, the artistic, you never know what you're going to come up with uh, uh, concept about the studio. Absolutely. That kind of, uh, I had a question actually about the Libertines. Uh, Please. Speaking of okay. having, uh, identity in recording, because there's that, Part in the book where you talk about uh i think it was the second batch of demos that you were given that sounded a lot like is this it yeah uh, and you sort of had a reaction to that um, yeah and i was curious sort of as you were then uh like preparing to do that record which you didn't end up doing um did uh -huh. you like were you sort of conscious of steering them away from trying to tap into that sort of stroke sound well, what was your you know, I have, I, have a, I have a small but intense story with the Libertines, okay? The first time I they sent me a demo, it's this acoustic kind of British folk band. I go like, yeah, I wouldn't know how to make that better. This sounds just fine the way it is. Then the second time I'm at their manager's house and she's playing these new demos and I'm going like, yeah, they copied the dirty, messy part of the strokes, but they didn't do anything about the orderly. You know, I was really upset. It just sounded like, I, I couldn't make heads or tails of it. They'd gone the opposite direction. It was just chaos, okay? But the very next day, I don't know why I agreed to, but she took me to see them in the rehearsal. She said, just come meet them, come see them. And I didn't know too many people in London, and I was about to leave London to go back home to New York. So I thought, well, I could meet some new people, and maybe I'll just have an experience, whatever. And And as soon as I walked in that room and they started playing the music, well... It wasn't like the Strokes at all. You know, Gary's drumming was incredibly fast and powerful. And he had like little bells on his ankles and he was hitting a tambourine with his other foot. You know, he he was going like really out there in his uh, percussion stuff. And then they got the harmonies going and just a, a, like Beatles, more like Beatles-esque chord changes at high punk tempo. It was It didn't remind me of the Strokes at all. I just felt like, oh, I just met the new Beatles age 18. Like, this is going to be amazing. So all my apprehension and misgivings about them flew out the window as soon as I heard them play live for me. I understood it, and I loved it. How did you feel about the, the finished product and Mick Jones uh, sort of ending up producing that record? I felt like, man, you know... It's, it's, drink drinking and taking drugs in the studio have a lot of lot to answer for this is not what i heard in that little practice room if i could have only captured what i heard in the practice room you know it just sounds like partying got the better you know there's some great song structures and there's still some songs i like on that record but i remember the first time hearing it going like oh why do they have to layer so many attitude guitars or what what well, just sounds like a jumble, you know, it's not what I heard at all. 
Yeah. Wow, like in a parallel universe, there's a Gordon Raphael Libertines album out there existing. I wish. I'd love to hear that one. I wish. There's in my head. I, I know how it would sound in my head. Amazing. Cool. Well, speaking about uh, how things sound in your head, uh, one of my favorite parts of the book was when you were just talking about the uh, the drum parts in uh, Is This It? And specifically those three tunes, uh, Soma, Hard to Explain, and, and Alone Together, where you're trying to get sounds more like a drum machine. And right. When I'm listening, first of all, amazing work. They're, it's, it's incredible. I, I, I really... Uh, really love that but when you're listening to them they do kind of have still each song sort of has its own thing in terms of the drum sound i was wondering if you could just kind of expand on that and because uh yeah i found that super interesting well it started on hard to explain which is done early in the session but we'd already done a few rock songs and i'd already done the ep so i was surprised when julian took me aside and said hey you know, I made the demo of this song on a drum machine, and I just love the way the drum machine sounds on this song, but I can't stand the idea of Fab not being on one of the songs on our first album. He's so young and enthusiastic, and it's our first record. You know, what can we possibly do? And I just thought that as soon as I heard that, it just was the perfect kind of challenge for me. It wasn't like some of the challenges they gave me that caused me sweat and kind of discomfort. This was like, oh, he's throwing the ball right at my bat. Because right. I've been working on industrial music with drum machines all through the 90s. It was my big deal. I love drum machines. And I could easily think of how to take a drum sound and turn it into a mechanical sound by destroying it, making it sound kind of doinky, and like smaller than or more artificial and more contained. So the first, I had a couple different ideas. The first was to... Uh, it was only going to be kick, snare, and hi-hat. And then on Hard to Explain, there's an overdubbed ride cymbal. You know, but it's not like a lot of toms, not like a lot of real drummer action, like inter interaction. So I spread the drum pieces out as far as they could reach. Like his foot is still playing the kick pedal, but it wasn't right under him. It was like he had to kind of reach his leg out, but he could still play. And then he didn't cross pattern to his hi-hat. He used his left hand on the hi-hat and it was kind of far away so that it wouldn't bleed into the snare. So I had this like separation, like a drum machine, when you hit the snare button, it's like, tch, tch, tch. you don't hear a little, pss, pss. there's no little hi-hat bit in the background. So separation and then kind of just using EQs, piling them on top, like one EQ and then another on top and then another on top. So I could just make it sound harsh and a little artificial. Okay, so those are two of the three components. The third component was having him play to a metronome and using only the best examples of each beat, like the intro beat, the verse beat, the chorus beat, the fill beat, you know, whatever that is, and then chopping them together. So it's like, you know, a repetitive pattern, but he's really playing it. It's not programmed, it's not quantized. So those are, those are the elements. And... Those three songs were done separately. Like one was done one day and then we do another song, another song, come back to it. So I never really did it the same. That's why there's a slight variation on those songs. And he played a different beat and he probably had the tunings of the drums were slightly different. So that's how it came to be. And that's why there's a variation. Cool. That's so interesting. Um, another thing I love about the book is how much you imbue your own philosophies, whether it's about recording, art, life, and there was something that really struck me when you were recording Satellites at Transportarum, New York City. Yes. Uh, yes. The lead singer, Jordy, said something so interesting to you. He said, yeah. you, listen, you take big jumps in life. Sometimes you make it, and sometimes you don't. And I'm wondering, how has that philosophy resonated with you throughout your life? Uh, that was one of the pivotal, changing moments of my life. You know, I actually... You know, in, I had, after my progressive rock phase of being in bands and being very complicated and precise and classical, you know, when punk rock and new wave came, it was okay to just be wild and, you know, make weird things that necessarily weren't in time or in tune, but they sounded wild and cool anyway. So it was in me. 
But as a producer, you know, trying to look out for everyone's best interest, I said like, hey, that was a fantastic lead vocal performance, but there's like one or two notes. And he looked at me like, what are you saying, fool? You know, just as soon as I even said that, he looked at me like, who are you, you know? And then when I showed him the notes, that's when he came up with that great quote about when, some, when you jump, sometimes you miss and sometimes you don't, it's fine, move on. Right. So I thought that was fantastic. And I, I quickly learned to love every note of that song. Yeah, I think it's a great life philosophy as well, you know. Sometimes you don't make the jump, but you yeah. just keep going. And yeah, keep going. You know, in, in, in a creative okay. arena as well, it's like not every project is going to come out the way you necessarily envision off the top. And yeah, I think what you are trying to say was you just got to keep going, you got to keep rolling with it, and you can't, you can't hold on to the loss, if you want to call it that, you know, to you sort of... Also, the idea of jumping, like he's just like, like Jeff Buckley, or like these people that are just like jumping up the neck into a new chord position or jumping to a note that's far away. It, you know, it's better to jump and try and see what glory can be found than like, okay, we're going to not go for that note, we're going to go for a safer, easier note that's it, it, there's something cool about the freedom to try. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the one of my my favorite parts of, of the book, or at least one that I really identified with you and the strokes in a particular situation was uh, the mastering days of Is This It? You know, uh. we've all been in, and I can speak for all of us and, and you, because I read about it in the book, like we've all been in maybe fancy studios where we feel like, oh, like, you know, you shouldn't touch that or we know best. And it, right. it, you kind of go along with that. And I remember you talking about how you know you weren't too familiar with mastering but you were really excited to go in but also worried that they weren't going to change the sound and you know you played the the mixes for them and they were like oh this won't do or we need to change this but what i really uh -huh. loved and found inspiring was that you and the band like stuck to your guns and were like i think yeah. i think the quote you have in the book is you know you very you, you took a pause and and then just kind of said i disagree and right, yeah that was the coolest thing um and we've all felt like that like you know it's our music we know you know yeah. and uh, i just want to know like how did you find the how did you and the strokes find the um the way to like kind of stick to your guns and also do you feel like you kind of vindicated after the fact you must that like is yeah. this it became such a game-changing album and everybody wanted to sound like is this it and 20 years later it's like a rock and roll masterpiece of the 21st century yeah. well i said i disagree through a giant lump in my throat because i was so upset you know um i had already had grief from the from the A and R guy from RCA earlier in the process, and that's really when the Strokes stood by me because, like, that guy specifically asked for things to change, like turn the snare drum up on the chorus. Everybody knows you have to do that. Take the distortion off the voice. So, but when I tried to humor him and do what he asked me to do, the guys in the band were just like looking sad. You know, they, I said, "Do you like that, Fab?" When I turn that up like that, he goes, "No." Yeah. So. You know, we already had the experience of them kind of sticking to their guns. And one of the reasons I felt some confidence is because every decision that was made, it wasn't my idea. It was me showing them something and they either liked it or wanted to fine tune it. It was very interactive. Um, probably if I had gone ahead and done what I only what I thought and then was called out by the A&R, the band would feel justified like, hey, man, he was just running with it. We didn't always agree with him. But because it was so much agreement on every sound that I had their support. And I wasn't that worried about the mastering changing it. I was mass worrying about coming from using Alisa's Studio 2 speakers, which are $250 a pair in my basement to these giant expensive tower speakers with their own tube amps on each side. And if I press the button for um, hard to explain, then maybe there would be no bass or maybe the bass was so fat that it ate all the drums in the good studio. So I brought my whole 
big computer and my screen and my pro tool set up so that in case I got caught out, I could quickly like put a plug in and try to save the day. But luckily it sounded just like the basement, just bigger and louder than we'd ever heard it before. Amazing. And it's interesting. You talked about like, Oh, everybody knows that the, the snare gets louder in the chorus or, or whatever. I just, you know, it's right. It's just great that you're like, well, you know, that can get old or stale or like you don't have to. It becomes predictable if you just play by the playbook all the time. And then, you know, the six of you or seven of you with JP like rewrote the playbook. And now you've you've got your own playbook where people are probably coming to you and like, can we get that thing like that? How do you get that hard to explain drum? How did how do you get that tone? And it's like, you know what? Hindsight is your friend, (laughs) Gordon. You really you really time is on your side with that one. Thanks a lot. Yeah, it, it definitely. As soon as uh, the, the the world gave love to that album and started talking about it and playing it all over the place, it was a vindication. It was it was like a, you know, yeah, our ideas were good ideas. They weren't like those professionals told us in that mastering lab. You know, they told me I was ruining Julian's chance to ever have a career by distorting his vocals. And yeah, you know, the opposite. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad that wasn't true. Yeah, not true. Um, speaking of like the legacy of that album, um, in like the coffee table rock and roll history, sort of, you know, I think is this it is sort of held up as this album that like killed grunge and like turned the page and like changed everything. And as someone you know, you know, you were in Seattle, like you were so sort of tied into that grunge scene. Did you feel like this was like a big page turner at the moment or did it make kind of sense in context of the music of the day and your experience well, see, grunge had a fantastic run and it, it played itself out there was no like feeling that the strokes came along and put a nail in grunge in fact on one of the last days of the sessions um i heard the strokes talking about pearl jam and i said hey i know th- those guys they go you know pearl jam oh my god we love them so much we love them and i said hey i'll write to stone and like show him the music you know just in case he's interested in it so they had no animosity towards like something like that but there had been a significant amount of time in my book i kind of say around 2000 about around 1996 with like Kurt offing himself and Soundgarden breaking. It felt like, oh man, it's over. You know, it just, it's no longer what it was in 89, 90, 91, 92, 93. It was like kind of a oh, sad little time. And in the meantime, every other style of music was coming up like drum and bass, acid jazz, jungle, all this DJ music. And that's what was happening. So it's kind of like society said, okay, now that Nirvana's over, now that the grunge thing's over, I think there's no more variations of rock and roll left. You know, it's kind of like time to put that thing from the 1950s, which lasted more than any other genre. You know, it lasted from the 50s to the 90s, trying to like put it away now and make room for other things. So I think it was in that context that suddenly surprise the next year everybody had guitars on their backs and were starting bands in england and in new york and that was beautiful incredible and to be a part of that must have been such a thrill it was good you know mostly it's good because all my life since i was 10 years old music was really important to me like a friend i listened to it before i go to bed i was in bands i was always up on the latest new musical rock and roll innovations and you know goth music the cure susie and the banshees then later like jeff buckley and soundgarden and allison chains and every it always made so much sense to me so when something i was associated with became special to the world and continues to this day it's more like i'm so glad i got to like give back something that came to me in abundance all my life it's just great to feel like it's doing work and it's inspiring people especially to be creative like i don't get a lot of people like 
I walk down the street and they go like, oh, I'm Gordon Raphael. Oh my God. Like, like I'm a pop star or something. No, they come up to me and they say, Hey, I work in a studio over there because I really like those recordings. Like when I heard them in high school and I wanted to be an engineer. So now I work in music or I play in a band. Like that to me is a beautiful thing. Right. I, I, I once heard Bob Dylan say the most an artist can do is inspire. And I think, yeah. yeah. Cool. Um, <clears throat> my next question kind of has to do with, with changing technology and mm. how that has kind of affected the role of, of a producer over, over time. I know, you know, mm. in around the two thousands, you were talking about just people having access to more, more channels. And that was something that wasn't super common before. And obviously that changed the game. And, and so right. in the last 20 years, technology has advanced a lot and I was just wondering your thoughts on changing technology and how that affects yeah the role of a producer um that's a very good question um at a certain point in like the mid 2000s 2010 12 it really seemed like especially where I was living in Berlin, like nobody really needed to go in the studio and record drums. They did programming and they made techno and electronic music. They could do it in their laptop. When they went on stage, it would just be like one guy with a microphone and maybe two guys behind him with their arm crossed or with a laptop doing lights or something. You know, that's a huge change. But I have noticed and anybody will notice that you know, they say people don't have attention span anymore and that the modern era of digital this and social media that has made it so that people can only concentrate on a short little amount of stuff. But then even if you look on the most, you know, short attention span website like TikTok, you're going to see 12 year old drummers giving lessons on how to do the most complicated rhythms. And that never came from a short attention span that came from sitting just like someone did a hundred years ago and did in the sixties of this woodshedding and practicing and metronome and teachers and, you know, performing. So you just see people playing the violin, the piano, everything. Instruments have not gone anywhere. People's attention span, not everybody played piano, not everybody played music, certainly never did. But I'm happy to see that there's many bands now. There's a huge explosion, especially after the pandemic, I think, of uh, people saying like, fuck, we don't want to get caught out in that again. Let's get out and play and get together as people and do music, you know, in case something like that ever happens again. There just seems to be a fever explosion in the UK, in New York. I saw it. Just young kids, bands, 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 rocking, big amps, Les Pauls. So luckily, uh, those kind of people do still need me to put a German microphone in front of their face with a LA-2A compressor. You can't do it with, you can't make that sound with a mic simulator and, uh, you know, a, dr a drum program. There's certain things that you still need uh, studios and microphones for. That's cool. On the other hand, the idea that we don't have to wait for a record label to let the world know that our band exists. You know, we don't have to line up and let them decide who they're going to talk. We can put our own picture on social media with a song we made last night and people in, you know, several places all over the world, like Brazil and Seattle and New York City, they could hear your song within one day and say, hey, that's really cool. And that, that's a brilliant advance in technology. I think that that is stupendous and helpful and liberating. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. It's an interesting time to be a, a creative person. Yeah, it is. Um, on that sort of radical creativity, one thing that struck me in your book was when you were working with Regina Spector. And oh, my God. And about a certain song called Chemo Limo that was very haunting that you yeah. perform and then you subsequently record it. On that, I was I was very interested because I mean your book is called "The World Is Going to Love This," right? Um, you often use that phrase. What is it to you personally about artists like Regina, or the Libertines, or the Strokes that that you know this is something special, even if it might not initially be what maybe a major record label would deem uh, right. appropriate for the masses? What are you looking for in, in artists that, that sort of spark that, that searing notion? Well, there's a number of uh, components that I would like to answer within your question. 
Like the first thing is, no, I didn't know that the strokes were going to be popular. I thought, oh boy, they just came along at the wrong time. Guitar music's over. All we have to do is put a cassette of this three song demo on any New York office. And as soon as they hear the guitars, they'll frisbee it into the trash. So I wasn't right about the strokes. Right. The only person, you know, when I heard Regina play, it just overwhelmed me with the, I said, in my mind, the world is going to love this. I have to record it. You know, this is going to be very valuable music. There's no way this can fail. That's how I felt about it. And what I always look for, I approach my job and everything like a music fan. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't, I wouldn't take money from some band that was just copying some other band and had nothing of their own or where the singer couldn't sing in tune. And I, what am I supposed to do? Work for four days hearing someone sing out of tune and then have my engineer put a computer plug in. Like, how could I listen to someone sing out of tune? I'm a music fan. I want to enjoy going into the studio and hey this is so much fun i love you guys music here i have an idea to join your idea i like that kind of thing so i always work with bands that i find are interesting and uh, luckily i seem to attract them as well because i hardly say no when bands say do you want to record us it's very rare that i say no and again that's because they know i'm not the guy that's going to put them on the radio I'm not going to make them sound like, you know, the top number one pop song, uh, but I will make them sound like they sound. I will give them a chance to like, let them hear their own ideas. And when their friends say, Oh, you actually sound better live than in the studio. That's when I step in and I make the studio sound. Oh, it's like your live show, but it's a little, got a little more magic or something like clarity or something like that. So, it, so is, is that what you would, define the role of a producer as someone that sort of brings out the essence of a, an artist i think there's different kinds of producers definitely different kinds there's like the kind i know what bill johnson over at the radio station is going to play so if you work with me i can make it exactly the way he likes it at the tempo you know i remember having meetings with universal in berlin universal record company and they were telling me that they have marketing tests where they play a bunch of songs that bands on their labels have written. And like, if the energy level gets above like four and a half, they can't put that song on the record because the radio won't play it. The, ra the radio is afraid that if you put something too aggressive or too energetic, that they've studies have shown that people will reach for the dial and put the competitor's radio station on. Wow. So there are certain producers that are that are working with the, the the guys at the labels and they know what the labels want. They know what the, that's not me. I don't know what anybody wants. I just know that as a musician, when I'm writing my, my songs and when I was 18 and 20 writing my own music, I wanted somebody to take me goddamn seriously. I wanted them to say like, how do you like that drum sound? Is that what you had in mind? And I could say things like, actually, I'd like five channels of snare drum. Five channels of snare drum, Gordon. What do you have in mind? Well, <laughs> I've got my distortion pedal. Can you make one of them through the distortion? Right. One through a big reverb, one through a little reverb so that I can like in the mix, like push one up and push some different one up and change it all the time, you know? But instead they said like, oh, 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 you might do that at home, but we don't do that here, you know? So I wanted to be the producer that... When the guy told me that he had these wild dreams and here's what he wants, I want to try to let him hear that sound to see if he likes it or if he wants a different suggestion. But first, show him the sound and before talking him out of it. That's just what what I'm doing, you know. Yeah, that's great. Just be creative. Yeah. yeah, it's like be be the champion guy on the side of the musician rather than a big expert who has a better idea all the time. Yeah. And talking about that, like just uh, how you're trying to bring the musicians like live show, the, the the energy of that, but in a studio setting and just trying to capture and listening to, you know, what the different musicians you've worked with over your career want and how to uh, execute that I, brings to my mind a new book a lot. You or from time to time, especially in the recording process, you talk about deciphering Julian's cryptic. Kind yeah. Of, uh, you know, this. 
this snare needs its tie loosened or like and trying right. to figure out what that means like how did obviously right. you you're really good at that but what was that experience like when it's more esoteric i was you know i'm i'm a pretty imaginative guy you know i'm pretty tripped out and i've you know, had a lot of strange experiences so when people talk poetically it's not like i don't like them i kind of like it but if it's too hard for me to understand i get a little bit bristling i go like why didn't he just tell me to turn more treble on or like yeah. why can't he just tell me to, like to you know talk to me in music language right. so sometimes when he talked to me in riddles i understood exactly what he meant and it was an easy thing to fix and sometimes i didn't understand it and sometimes if even if i did understand it it would take a lot of sweat and blood to find out what the hell he's after you know like Every single knob in the studio, every piece of equipment, every plug-in, you know, and, and he could feel me getting angry and impatient with him sometimes. But it was also kind of charming. I don't know if he still does that, but he, he certainly did it a lot when I worked with him. And now, do you think that was because he didn't know what he wanted, per se, till he heard it? Like, or he wasn't intentionally trying to be difficult sometimes. He just really maybe didn't know the sound until it presented itself in front of him? I know that he made lots of demos at home and he had a couple of very negative experiences with the strokes in the er before they got to me. They told me they had tried working in studios and they really hated the vibe and they hated the experts and they hated the lighting and decor of the studio. They had a lot not to right. like about it. The drinks. So I really believe that when he was telling me things, he was using the best descriptive and he's very, very imaginative and very literate guy, you know. He has a huge vocabulary and a huge set of concepts. So if he said, it sounds like the whole drum set is at a party, but the hi-hat is waiting outside and can't get in. Could you let him in? You know, I, okay, I get it. I'm supposed to listen for what everything else has that the hi-hat doesn't and kind of put that into the context. Yeah. And one other thing I really liked that I thought like, I mean, I really enjoyed reading your book and I thought I got to know you as a person because the vernacular, it feels much like we're talking right now. It's very conversational, uh, but that story you had as uh, the engineer and the producer about you were just, I can't remember which song it was uh, right now. I maybe you're just wrapping something up, but it's a late night and you're already maybe shutting down the machines or doing a bounce down. And, and then Julian's like, well, can we hear the, the vocal yeah. a little louder here and, and you're like kind of you know you were frustrated and tired at that point and you humored him with one tenth of a decibel and then that uh existential moment you had as mr producer man but also a lover of music just came to a crossroads you're like well do i save face by saying no there's no audible difference and you know let's go home or do i admit that yeah you know what i am tired and frustrated but that actually does sound better like Right. Uh, that was just a cool, cool moment in the studio. We've all had experiences with working with people. I think uh, engineers can be sometimes like, oh, no, man, that's, you know, the, everybody knows that the snare should be louder in the chorus. And that's right. that. So end of day. But I love that about you. And I really felt like I got to know you, like who you were as a person behind the work in that moment. I was like, man, that'd be really cool to work with that guy. Yeah, that actually, that story goes hand in hand with Jordi Herrera from the satellites, you know, where I'm pointing out something and he's just, no, let me tell you that that is correct. You know, so that was a turning point where I had to open my mind even further and deal with that for the rest of my career. And then this thing with Julian, where I was convinced you know we'd already gone over this a bunch of times and this was the best place and that's not my philosophy so i was acting in my tired frustrated sense against my open fun guy philosophy and telling him you know this is come on don't be ridiculous nobody can hear a tenth of a decibel you know I said what's the smallest unit you can turn it up in pro tools i said one tenth of a db you'll never hear that he goes humor me Oh, God damn it. Okay, I'll put your tent to the death of them. And then, yeah, that moment where, you know, do I pretend it's not better? Or do I just tell him you're fucking right and just get on with it and finish the day? And I'm glad I chose the latter. Yeah, and that must have been like a set. Like they obviously already liked working with you, but that must have been a huge sense of relief. We've all been up with that. Like, n n 99 people out of 100 would have been like, 
So you can't hear a difference. It's fine. I don't hear a difference. Good night. And like the fact you did, like, must have just so ingratiated. You already had a strong relationship and working yeah. together was very good. But uh, I thought that particular anecdote was, you know, real proof in the pudding about why you Thank all you. worked so well together. Yeah. Yeah. Anybody else, would say, anybody, anybody else would say like, "Hey, man, it." I told you we're working till midnight. It's yeah. you know one thirty. We gotta go. I've got something to do in the morning. You know, any there's a million ways you could have kind of curtailed that progress. Exactly. When you're going into a new session or working with a new artist, do you find yourself using a lot of templates or sort of? Do you think like, oh, I have a vocal chain that always works or a kick drum, I always going to do a kick drum the same way? Or do you really try and listen to what they're doing and sort of approach each element of it as a new challenge to kind of flesh out what whatever they're trying to do? I have a few templates philosophically. The first template is when they show me some music online and I go, oh, yeah, this is cool music. Let's do a project. OK, then there's going to be a lot of talking. You know, like, what do you have in mind? Who's in your band? What are the instruments? Um, how can you play all together except for the vocals? And uh, do you need headphones? Who needs a click track? I you know there's like, I got to find out a lot of information so that they know what's going to happen. And I know what's going to happen. I can also predict within, a, you know, micro moments of time, how long it's going to take to do these two songs, four songs, six, however many they want to do. So part of the template is a lot of communicating before any stays in the studio or before even agreeing that we're going to go, I'm going to fly to their town or they're going to come to my town. And then, you know, as I say, 90 point, you know, 99 percent of the people just want to do this thing I'm selling them, which is stand around with no headphones, with your amps near you, looking at your friends, just like you do at practice and play the music. And I'll pretty much get... You know, you'll be able to hear it like a record. It won't just be a mess. It won't be like an iPhone recording. It will sound like power. Okay. And I say, that's how we recorded the strokes. And they go, okay, we believe you. Yeah. <laughs> that's a good thing, you know. And then once they do that, then I have to make an input. My other secret weapon, as I talk about in the book, is I like to have the studio completely set up before the band even comes. That means someone from the studio, if I'm not in their town, has to get a list from me and be very comfortable and happy to do this. And it happened like again, almost all the time the, the the studios will do it. Once every two years, one studio says, That'll cost you five hundred dollars because we got to have two engineers an extra two hours, whatever. And I say, well, in that case, we'll just do it when we get there. But with all these really nice studios that are happy to have me coming and happy to have this session, you know, I go, "What do you have at your studio? Send me a gear list." And I'm looking for certain things. If they don't have certain things, I talk to talk to the band about finding a different studio. But I don't need millions of dollars of equipment i don't even need like say 20 good channels i need a few good channels i need like kick drum bass guitar guitar and vocals that that's got to be like the best you can get api ssl neve uh, avalon something like that the rest of it Pardon me, Mr. Mackey, but could be Mackey, could be Baron. I don't care what I'm really putting. You know, I can put whatever on the hi hat, and it'll sound like a hi hat, and it's going to come through the overhead mics anyway. So, and then it, then I look at the studio list. I go, great, they got that uh, 421 Sennheiser. I love putting that in the pick drum. So that at that point, I pick my favorite mics and preamps that I know always work and always give great sound. And then if somebody wants a variation, well, if you want it brighter, just you got your amp there, turn the treble up. If you want it weirder, you got those pedals there, like put some swirly dishwasher sounds on your guitar and we'll capture it with those 421 Sennheisers through the API. Mm -hmm. So yeah, there are some microphones and preamps and speakers and computers and software programs and plugins that I love that really help me. Um, but if I don't have some of that, I can substitute something else within reason. Right. And speaking on pre's, uh, as somebody playing the Julian role in a Strokes tribute, and somebody who might not be able to transport an Avalon 737 pre to every show, 
because I did read that um, for the first couple records, I, I th actually I think it was a, a talk that you did where you said that for the first couple records they actually brought the 737 with them on the road. What would you yeah, recommend? Sure. Sorry, go on. I think at this point there's just so many things you could do, you know, that weren't available then. Like sometimes when a band uh, is in the studio and I've recorded something, and then they say after I've recorded it, they go like, uh, you know, could you put some distortion on that? <laughs> you know, after the fact, <laughs> and I, go, I go, yeah, and I open Sans app. Yeah, Sans app, the plugin or the pedal, it, it can just do a million things. It can do a million. It can do subtle, you know, insulting, cutting muted it can it can make beautiful distorted sounds so that's something you're yeah. taking on the road potentially i think that it's good to experiment with anything you can get your hands on or go to a music store mm -hmm. and combine it with whatever mic you think you're going to be using also because it, like sound effects make a lot of difference whether you're using a condenser a handheld condenser or an sm57 and just uh you know just try stuff out there's so many, so many cool distortion pedals you can use, but also you might want some bands like to have a different vocal sound, like a delay and a distortion, a chorus and a just you know, there's pedals with many effects. Mm -hmm. Even Tide makes fantastic pedals for stuff. And yeah. Or auto-tune, they have the auto-tune pedals, you know, inside many many companies put those in. Yeah. Yeah, I have a question for you actually on auto tune. <clears throat> okay. Was there auto tune used on Room on Fire? No, I never used auto tune. I've never used it. I have never used auto tune. Sometimes, um, not with the, not at the strokes. I don't think so with the strokes. But sometimes, if a band has done a whole record and there's two notes that at the end of listening day, if usually if, if they're singing it and they sing it out of two note, either I will see it or they will see it. And then it's like, okay, sing it again. There you got it. You know, that's how we, that's how I fix out of tune stuff. And then if something makes it to the very end and there's like one thing that I wish was a little different, I'll use a pitch plugin where I choose how many cents, like, Oh, that's 19 cents flat. Let me try 19 cents. And I hardcore change the audio file to 19 cents higher. And then I go like, yeah, that's great. Or, oh, no, I, I need to do 23. Mm -hmm. Just put like two notes on an album. I don't do it for, I don't work on tuning stuff. I never spend my time doing that. So not even for like stylistic purposes. I've never used it. I have never used Melodyne and I've never opened um, um, Auto-Tune. So it's just not... It's not in my vocabulary. Interesting. I, I only ask about that album because I know there's been some uh, some discourse out there about whether or not Julian used that on Whatever Happens because there's a there's a performance of them doing it on Conan where a lot of people think that he's using auto-tune. And I was just wondering uh -huh. if that was ever utilized, but there, there we go. Uh -huh. Okay. Since I don't know how to use it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, was there I would say no. Okay. Well, was there a major difference between attitude or disposition of the band and you and JP between the two the two albums, as I said, in Room on Fire and the recording process? Uh, there's a lot of difference between you know the Strokes in their brains being these kids that maybe are going to get a chance at a music career, which is the first album. Like, hey, if we play our cards right, we don't have to be students and bartenders. We could maybe play concerts. Okay, that's the attitude going into the first record. The second record is, oh, my God, we have just been in buses, planes, hotels with each other for two years, playing hundreds of shows around and around the world. What the fuck has happened to our lives, man? And now we're going to make an album. OK, all right. And so, so one of the positive sides of playing 200 shows was how good were they technically? You know, how much more powerful and steady was Fab? And how, how just wild and out of control was Nick Valencia's guitar playing? He just like, they all just got so much better. Right. And then a di th that on top of a different set of songs, you know, just different kind of different people writing different songs. And that's what, that's what you hear. So when they gave you that private show of, of Room on Fire for the first time in yeah. the library, did you have yeah. any preconceived notions going into that? 
about what the next record might sound like, or were you looking for anything at all, stylistic? Uh, just like on Is This It, except for the three songs that I had recorded on the EP, I had never heard, I didn't know what was coming. We got this song called Is This It, okay? Go out and show me, I'll adjust the levels, you know? I never knew what it was going to be. And so same for Room on Fire, I'm sitting in a chair, and they're playing me the stuff. And right away, I'm noticing, oh, my God, this isn't like these skinny kids anymore. They're like hitting hard like Led Zeppelin. It's really like banging music. And I was just blown away by how far they'd come. That's what hit me. And I'm like, yeah, we're going to record this. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so powerful. That's all. It was powerful. Yeah. Yeah. I was wondering if you could... Uh give an anecdote that didn't make it into the book, whether it's something challenging or emotional or, or funny, um, just something that we wouldn't have read about. You know, I don't know, because I think I just rat racked my brain to put every single thing that would be related to those experiences. Um, uh, yeah, fair enough. I'll tell you, I'll, I'll tell you a modern anecdote with uh, Julian Sablancas, just a funny thing. Okay. I, I knew I had arranged this trip to New York to record a bunch of bands in October. And I went to London to do a book talk because my publisher is very keen that if, if the Strokes ever play somewhere in the UK, she wants me to do a book talk the day before in the same town. So I did Glasgow two summers ago and I did London. I went to London to do my book talk. And when I got to London, I called up uh, Julian's manager and I said, hey, when are they getting to town? And he said, oh, they're coming today. In fact, it's Julian's birthday. You're invited to his party if you want to go. So I was like, all right. I land in London just in time to go hang out with Julian. Well, I haven't seen in a year. And uh, so I'm at his birthday party and I'm thinking, hmm, how am I going to phrase this to him? And I said, hey, Julian, I'm coming to New York next month. He goes, oh, you are? And I go, yeah, would you like to um, have a cup of coffee or do some recording? And he goes, like, let me think. Yeah, let's do some recording. Let's do some recording. I said, really? W what do you want to record? He said, I want to record the voids. And, um, yeah, so he started all of a sudden, because I asked him for a cup of coffee and dared to mention the word recording, he started chatting with me about possibly doing some uh, work with, um with the voids so that's the, that's an anecdote and it made me think of one more if you don't mind of course please. Amazing, please in glasgow not only did i do a book signing it was only a couple months after my book came out but i went to the glasgow show of the strokes transmit festival and i brought signed copies for each member of the band i was gonna make a big deal of going to, up to them saying here here i've given you here's a, a book i wrote about your band you know and about us working together and i went up to they had a big after party at in julian's hotel suite which is the top of a hotel with many rooms and fireplaces and lots of people were there and I was, I gave, like, I, get, I went to Albert and I said, hey, Albert, I got a book. He said, oh, great. Give it to my personal manager. So, okay, I gave it to, so each person, like, had me give it to their manager to hold for the tour. <laughs> and then it, I wanted to give Julian his book. And I, it was getting, like, two or three in the morning, and I was really tired. I wanted to go home. So I was looking for him and looking for him, and, was, and I saw him with some, like, Ar Argentinian girl they had met. And all of a sudden, as I'm about to walk up to him, he like sits on the couch with her and starts kissing her. And like, so I'm just like kind of standing awkwardly with my book in my hand in front of Julian, who's like kissing this girl. And he looks over at me and he goes, oh, Gordon, you want, you want to join in? And I go, oh, no, 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 no Julian, uh, that's okay. But I wanted to give you this book. And he goes, oh, really? And he looked at the book and he looked at the cover and he looked up at me and said, you know what, Gordon? I'm never going to read this book. <laughs> I'm never going to read this book. He said, from time to time, I'm going to open it and peek at one word and then close it. <laughs> That's amazing. Those are two modern Julian <laughs> anecdotes that aren't in my book. The best I could do. Oh, that's <laughs> amazing. amazing. Wow. Well, I mean, you're so honest in your book. And so raw and 
I just want to thank you for for putting that out into the world. And I just Thanks wanted for to, it. yeah. Oh my God, yeah. It was such a pleasure to read, and and more people need to read it. Um, I was wondering what the process was like for you going back, and even aside from from musical endeavors, um, what it was like retreading old personal history, whether it was with an old flame or friendships that might have gone through different uh, evolutions. What was that like? compiling all those memories again? That's a very lovely question. Well, I've always been into reading. Like reading, I got to reading before music, really. Just reading and books were like a big thing for me. And I loved writing. I was really good at writing in school. So in the back of my mind, I always wanted to write a book about my weird adventures, all these trips and journeys I've been on. So at a certain point, I thought, you know, if I could write a book about the strokes part of my life, maybe I could attract readers that want to find out about the other parts of my life, okay? That was my idea. But really, in the back of my mind, I knew I'd never write a book because I don't like to sit down. Uh-huh. You know, if I'm not, I have to sit down and work on music. But if I don't have to do that, I like to walk around, just walk around a town. And I like to go to coffee shops and look in record stores. I don't like to sit down in my lonely room with a typewriter and like, then I did this, then I did that. Like, that's just, I couldn't get my head around that. But when the pandemic came, I tried to write a song and I go, God, I've written so many songs. I don't really feel like writing another song. And then a little voice said, what about that book? the book, you know, and oh, yeah. And basically, the book was going to be every time I fly around the world and go to Brazil or Mexico or Seattle or Arizona, everyone asks the same question, like, hey, what was it like working with Julian? Hey, how'd you get that drum sound on hard to explain? You know, it's always this. So I've been telling these stories, like a robot, like over and over again, and everybody loves hearing it. So I thought I'm just going to tell all the stories once and for all get them out of my system in a row. And I thought, where am I going to start this story? Where am I going to start? God damn. And okay, I'm sitting at my favorite cafe in New York City when I moved there in the 90s, about to become a professional producer, but I didn't know that yet. And I'm drinking coffee in my favorite cafe, wondering what the hell I'm going to do with my life. Mm -hmm. So the first thing that's popped in my mind is where do you start the book? And then one story just came. I knew what was going to come. I knew, you know, how to do all that. The one thing I didn't know, and I had to very interestingly use the internet, was they have a website called setlist.io. I love which it. Tells, I love it. It tells every band where they played, what the set list was. So if I wanted to know what happened first? Did this? Did I do this with the Strokes? And then they played with Guided by Voice. I just look up the Guided by Voices show, and yeah. there's the date. And how I can. I come, <laughs> what? How, how do they have that 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 backlog? I, I, I don't, don't know how they know, but I, I was checking that all the time to help my chronology to make sure I put my story in a logical order. Even though there's flashbacks and flash forwards and flash forwards within flash, there's all kinds of weird time jumping. But I was really happy that I could use this online resource to check my chronology and make sure my story was kind of chronologically true. Cool. Cool. Yeah. I I have a question. You've been, your career is taking you all over the world. Is there a city in the world that's your absolute favorite? Because like I see, you know, you lived in Berlin, you lived in London, New York, obviously. Is, Is there a city that when you get off the plane, you feel like you're home? It changes from time to time. For example, I just had the most profound experience in New York I've ever had. And I've gone to New York a number of times in the last 20 years. And I just like walk around lonely on the street, like looking at my old shops and never talk to anybody and never, no one ever says, hi, Gordon, or hey, it's Gordon. But this time it was like out of the woodwork. Every day I was meeting people and working with bands and meeting strangers and everybody wanted to talk to me. It was like a real... That felt a lot like home. Like going there in New York really felt like home this time. Wow. Now, there is a city that's not my favorite. I wouldn't want to live there. It's not my favorite city in the world. But there's a city that's been so kind to me. And I have a big love for it, which is Argentina and Buenos Aires. Um, when Europe and America and England all were kind of like rock and rolls over in mid-2000s, like there's no work for you. 
if I walked down the streets in Buenos Aires, everybody wanted to talk to me. I was working. I had my own band there. I had art shows and photo shows, which I've never done anywhere else. I don't know how to do that. But they were like, you want to show your pictures? Here's a gallery. You want to play with your band? Here's a tour of South America. You know, it was just everything was doable and, and like magic there for me. So I would say that Buenos Aires has been one of the best places for my music in the last 20 years, for sure. Very cool. Incredible. Right on. Incredible. Yeah, I mean, playing in the Brokes, uh, we, you know, we got a lot of obviously diehard Strokes fans coming out and there's a huge South American contingent. And uh, yeah. They, and love, the strokes, they, they just seem to love rock and roll music. Definitely. Yes. It's incredible. And there's a, reason, there's a reason for it, which is really strange, which I didn't find out till a little after I'd already noticed that I'm having great luck there. And that is that Argentina specifically had a very brutal dictatorship in the 80s, like almost like their own fascistic dictatorship. And this guy did really awful things to the people, and he did even worse things to his enemies. And he made it illegal for anybody to talk negatively about his dictatorship. But certain musicians in the rock and roll field were able to make coded messages in songs that gave the families great hope and connected the families through rock music. Wow. So for them, they never forgot what rock and roll did for their family in this time of political oppression. And so anybody with a guitar, anybody is, he's known for guitar music. He's known to be a rocker. It's like you have the family's respect from the heart and nothing like it in the world. I don't know any other story like that. And so they have like their own John Lennon and their own like top guys from that time in history. Charlie Garcia is one of the guys. Spinetta is one of the guys. But that's why there's this like passion in South America that rock and roll music is a savior and it's a family healer. Crazy, right? Wow, that's amazing. Yeah, that's that, yeah, that's, that's incredible. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Gordon, we really, really appreciate you taking the time today to talk to us. Yeah. You've had great questions and really fun uh, energy. Thank you. Excellent. Well, listen, all the best. Yes. And um, Yeah, and again, thank you for your time. You're very welcome. Good luck on your music, that's for sure. Thank Thanks, you, man. Hopefully thank we you see so you much. one day. Yeah. Hey. We'll, yeah, we'll come visit you someday in London. And I'll, I'll uh, come uh, record you in Toronto sometime. Sounds oh, great. Beautiful. Got yourself yeah. a deal. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right. I like Toronto. Right. I want to get back. Bye. Great. Well, Gordon loves you. you. You're welcome yeah. anytime. Thanks All so right. much, Gordon. Okay. Thank you, man. Thanks, Gordon. Thanks, buddy. Cheers, guys. Cheers. Cheers. Cheers.